so what's up everybody john the morgyle back with a video response to a question slash comment that i got from a subscriber uh, i recently realized and i actually posted evidence in a recent video uh, and i'll actually roll that here as well that my comments on youtube when i'm logged in as the morgyle appear to go up to me on visible public threads but when i log out of the morgyle account uh, and view the same video as anonymous or view the same video uh, thread from a different account altogether, comments that, you know, that I've posted as the Morgyle simply don't exist. And um, this is occurring not only on my own videos, but also on others' videos. Now, uh, I'm starting to do some video responses to comments that I get because it seems that, like, I can't even reply to comments uh, in many cases uh, on video threads, whether it's my threads or others threads. So, uh, the question comes from a subscriber who will remain anonymous as uh, he or she did post this question uh, to me as a private message on YouTube. So the question or comment was, I was wondering, uh, quote, I was wondering if you have anything to explain the trips from Santiago to Sydney, as this seems to be the last piece of the puzzle to me. Okay, so uh, my answer to that, and this is something that does come up a lot, is, uh, hello, Claude, we'll keep it at a first name basis, there's millions of Claudes out there. Um, you know, that's a question that gets asked a lot, and I feel like the problem, you know, that people have with these flights are more perceived problems or really misunderstandings as opposed to real, actual, physical problems with the flat earth reality. So, here's the deal. Uh, the AE, or azimuthal equidistant projection map, has some major flaws in the matrix of the map that are eh, fairly similar to the flaws in the scientifically accepted Mercator projection and the like. So here's the difference between the two. Uh, we'll start with the Mercator projection, and this applies to others like the Peters projection. Um, I would first mention that the Mercator projection nor the Peters projection are models of the Earth, uh, nor are they an adequate representation of the actual face of the Earth. Um, these are merely projections based on estimations derived from latitude and longitude lines, uh, which are based on heavenly lights and magnetic north and time. So the Mercator projection is, by definition, a cylindrical conformal map. Now, what this means, the long and short of it is that the equator of the map, you know, the straight line directly across the center, is most correct or most accurate. Uh, that is the most accurate portion of the map in terms of relative sizes of and distances between the large continental land masses, as well as the seas that separate them. Now, as you stray either north or south of the equator, uh, the less and less accurate the Mercator projection becomes uh, to the point to where the 90 degree latitudes of north and south, so the poles, uh, these single points on the sphere are stretched to infinity across the entire length of the top and bottom of the map. So in other words, the top and bottom of the Mercator projection and the Peters uh, depiction uh, are so far removed from what the actual sizes and distances between the areas, any significant distance from the equator as uh, extremely skewed and inaccurate. So pretty much everywhere south of the Tropic of Capricorn or north of the Tropic of Cancer, uh, the relative sizes and distances of continents cannot possibly be correct on the Mercator projection by definition. Yet it allows for adequate navigation as it relied throughout history on manual navigation, which always involved magnetic north, as well as celestial observations, which are ascribed to mathematically defined lines of latitude and longitude. Now, this map, the Mercator projection, allows for long distance travel across great oceans. However, it is not an accurate depiction of the overall face of the Earth. Uh, the reason the Mercator projection is sufficient for navigation, while being so inaccurate in terms of an actual representation of the face of the Earth, is because it includes what are called lines of constant course, or it was designed uh, with this uh, concept of lines of constant course, uh, which are derived, again, from magnetic north and astronomical observations, which are ascribed to the lines of latitude and longitude. 
So uh, in other words, on the Mercator projection, you can draw a uh, straight line, a horizontal line from right to left, and that would be due west from say Europe to America. However, the relative sizes of and the distances betwixt the two continents is inherently going to be skewed in the Mercator projection, becoming more and more exacerbated as you gain a distance north of the equator in the case of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in the case of the Southern Hemisphere, it's a little bit different, especially considering the Flat Earth model. Now, the other big problem with the Mercator projection is um, what essentially used by modern science, the Mercator projection or the updated Peters projection, which is essentially the same deal as the Mercator projection. Uh, but this other big problem is the fact that one can only circumnavigate uh, from east to west, uh, but certainly not from north to south on the Mercator projection or Peter's projection. So if you head uh, west from the left of the Mercator projection, you will instantly pop out at the right side of the map. <laughs> uh, according to Globers, this is because it's a globe, but according to reality, you're merely describing a circle upon a plane around the magnetic central pole. Now, if you do head south from the bottom of the Mercator projection, uh, for example, you will not pop out at the top, um, which is, you know, a major problem. However, that's where they get the cylindrical part of the uh, type of projection, the cylindrical conformal map. Now, if you do head, let's just say due north from the top, um, what, according to the heliocentric model in the Mercator projection, what will happen is, is you'll essentially make a bell curve on that map. Let's see, I'm trying to do this backwards. You'll essentially make a bell curve on that map where if you head due north, uh, you'll sort of go over like this and head on the opposite meridian line. Same thing if you head south, you make sort of a bell curve and head uh, like this and make a bell curve on the opposite uh, meridian line from where you started if you keep a constant course. That's allegedly what would happen on a Mercator uh, sort of projection if you head north from the North Pole. And again, that's the way the map's designed, but I submit the reason why uh, circumnavigation was built into the Mercator projection strictly in an east to west fashion. So like, you know, if you head uh, this way, you're gonna pop out over here. Um, if you head that away, you're going to pop out over here, right? And so uh, that is, uh, in the flat earth model, makes perfect sense because everything is wrapped around the central north, uh, which is the, where your compass needle is always going to point. So in circumnavigating, you're not going around a globe, you're just merely, again, describing a circle upon a plane. Now, I'm going to go ahead and submit that the real reason why you can't circumnavigate, you know, start from the top of the Mercator projection and pop out at the bottom is uh, not just simply because it's a cylindrical map, but because north to south uh, circumnavigation is impossible. Uh, it is impossible to, uh, say, start in the North Pole, head south along a single meridian line, a constant heading, uh, cross over the southern uh, polar region, continue your same heading on the opposite meridian line and uh, continue north to the North Pole. Uh, nobody has in history ever done that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just read from this little uh, diagram I have here. Uh, not one single person in history has even attempted to completely circumnavigate the world from north to south, keeping a constant heading or more or less constant heading upon a single meridian line, traversing both quote unquote poles in a single flight or even a series of consecutive flights. Uh, such a thing is totally doable in terms of aviation technology. However, the problem uh, is not in technology. The problem is, is you cannot circumnavigate a globe that doesn't actually exist. Now, as many people who have won their claim to fame for circumnavigating the world in an east to west fashion, you would think that loads of adventurers would decide to outdo all those other lazy bastards and circumnavigate the polar areas, you know, going north to south, starting in one pole, going around the other pole, and winding up back in the pole where you started. Now, if we lived on a globe, 
uh, even circumnavigation uh, wouldn't even necessarily be all that we see in terms of uh, far south. Um, if we lived on a globe, we would certainly have uh, seen people at least attempting to do this by now, but we would also see extremely heavy airline traffic around the Antarctic Circle. In truth, all flights, even those traveling from a point in the southern hemisphere to another point in the southern hemisphere, will for some reason always, or as a rule, almost always head towards the north for the initial leg of the journey. Uh, very seldom do you see even claims of flights which uh, strictly adhere to the southern hemisphere uh, and the south polar region. This uh, south polar region is avoided like the plague by air traffic. Now this is not due to the inhospitable conditions, quote unquote, but instead it's because uh, traveling towards the north is the only shortcut in reality. Whenever you travel south, uh, if you're looking at sort of an AE uh, type of projection, you're heading away from everything. So the South Polar Circle uh, should be, in, in a globe Earth scenario, should be a shortcut to loads of southern destinations from southern departure points, yet we do not see this as uh, frequently uh, as we should. I mean, you can look at this map of uh, common air traffic routes and there really isn't anything going uh, you know, sticking to the Southern Hemisphere, except for one or two, which for all we know, those could be totally fake uh, flights that are just put there. But you can clearly see that the majority of flights, even going from Southern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere destinations, uh, wind up for some reason going deep into the North. Now this makes perfect sense on a flat Earth, of course. It makes no sense on a globe. You should see tons and tons of traffic going around that uh, South Arctic area, simply because it would be a shortcut to lots of places in the South. But they don't, so there you have it. Um, tons and tons of people have circumnavigated the world going east to west. However, not one single person in history has circumnavigated the world going north to south because that is physically impossible uh, since the Earth is a plane with the uh, magnetic north in the center as opposed to on top of the globe. Right. Now, all of the previous mentions are just a few admitted problems uh, with the Mercator projection in terms of the relative sizes and distances becoming uh, skewed uh, the further you get from the equator by definition of the type of map that it is. But what's so funny about all this to me is the fact that NASA's images of the continents uh, and the distances between them are exactly what we see on the Mercator projection. And really, it's exactly what we see on the globe as well, which is physically impossible, uh, proving that NASA is faking their images of continents yet again. You know, NASA's been caught lying. Okay, so just to sort of break down what you're looking at here, on the left-hand side, you've got what is obviously a forged uh, CGI NASA image uh, of allegedly the United States from space. Um, the only thing I did with this was brighten up the, uh, you know, brighten it up and the, alter the contrast a bit so that you could see the definition a bit better because it was sort of hard to see. And I, do, I did notice this sort of watermark encoded in the image uh, with a uh, pentangle. You can kind of see it. Uh, maybe I'll throw another one with this uh, extra showed up. But yeah, you can see this strange symbol with the pentangle and then the, the letters P-O-N-D-5, it looks like. So anyway, um, you've got this uh, image uh, allegedly taken from space of the United States. And when you compare that with the Mercator projection, it's uh, very clearly obvious, pretty much identical to what you see on the Mercator projection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this image into uh, Adobe Illustrator and I'm just going to draw a basic uh, line art around the outline of the United States or really the, I guess you could say the Gulf of Mexico and sort of the, the southern coastlines and then the western coastline uh, just to see how spot on they do match. Now obviously what NASA has done is they have uh, taken the Mercator projection and, you know, wrapped it around the sphere in a CGI program, in a 3D modeling program. Honestly, what I found was, is the, uh, you know, obviously very quickly, hastily drawn uh, line art. I, I scaled it down to scale and it was a near perfect fit. 
And then in order for in order to get it to fit, all I had to do was sort of um, scale it down. That right there, you can see I scaled it down unproportionately, but that would be because NASA would have wrapped that image around a sphere. So uh, what this means, the fact that the Mercator projection matches what NASA claims to be footage of the Earth from space, it proves that NASA is faking their images because the Mercator projection inherently has flaws in it in terms of uh, accurately representing the sizes, shapes, and distances between continents and uh, land masses. So there you have that. Uh, because it would be physically impossible for the Mercator projection maps uh, to look anything like what the actual land masses look like, uh, simply due to the nature of the matrix of the map. Uh, the map uh, projection, the Mercator projection, was not designed to be an accurate representation of the Earth. It was designed to allow for easy navigation using lines of constant cores, uh, which are again, a, you know, mathematically ascribed latitude and longitude lines based on the celestial observations over time. Okay, so, but yeah, the fact that NASA shows us images of South America and North America that look pretty much identical to what the uh, more modernized uh, projections look like uh, just goes to show that they're lying. Uh, okay, so I also find it really suspect that Gerardus Mercator fairly well mapped out the entire United States, including California, although the original Mercator projection was not 100% accurate, it was very accurate uh, for a land that had only just been discovered, uh, a land the size of America that had only just been discovered about 100 years prior to him making his projection. However, California had only just been discovered when he uh, completed his projection and explorers were literally still mapping the coastlines and the inland areas of California for about 200 years after Mercator's original projection. So how could he have possibly gotten even close uh, to you know, what the United States looked like, in including California, when the data simply wasn't there when he created the map? Uh, could it be uh, that, like we often see, uh, the theoretical models of very brilliant and esteemed people, especially when you're dealing with Globers, uh, these theoretical models are always pushed forward and somehow miraculously confirmed by science as being accurate and true, uh, even if it happens to not be true. You know, another example would be Einstein's theory of relativity in space-time. Just because he thunk it and uh, convinced people of it, doesn't mean that you can point to it as proof that the uh, quote-unquote vacuum of space is a uh, rectilinear mesh of space and time that is warped by large massive objects in space like the planets and the stars uh, in order to cause this whimsical gravity which is exactly a vacuum pushing uh, against atmosphere which is impossible but anyway how could you know Mercator have possibly been even close uh, when the data wasn't even there uh, when he created the map. Could it be that, uh, you know, we often see theoretical models of the, uh, you know, Globers are always pushed forward by science as truth, even if it's not so true or maybe not confirmed yet. Now, uh, for example, another example would be when the moon landings occurred, the scientists expected one-sixth Earth gravity, quotes, due to the alleged mass of the moon. Now, one huge thing they forgot to consider was that even if we give them, you know, for argument's sake, the one-six mass of the moon, uh, they forgot to consider the fact that the Earth is uh, very heavy with atmosphere. There's a lot of atmospheric or barometric pressure uh, pushing down upon sea level at about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, if you spread out an entire page of the newspaper, there's almost 9,000 pounds of air on that uh, piece of newspaper. Okay, so there is a great deal of barometric pressure on Earth, which is indeed what uh, gives 
us most of our weight on a scale, and that is according to either the heliocentric model or the flat earth model. Uh, gravity is such a weak force, it is merely a, a described as an acceleration or a tendency for higher density objects to find their way down. However, in the flat earth reality, we understand that gravity doesn't exist. Uh, the grandfather of gravity, Newton, didn't understand the first thing about electromagnetism. However, the earth itself is exactly a, a giant capacitor plate it holds a static electric charge and a static electric charge is always an attractive force which is exactly the nudge you need for the laws of density and buoyancy to work so uh, gravity is yet again unnecessary um, gravity started being unnecessary when you realize that the earth isn't a spinning sphere uh, it's completely unnecessary when you understand density and buoyancy and the fundamental premise that governs density and buoyancy is indeed electromagnetic or the static electric charge of the earth it has nothing to do with the theoretical nonsensical absurd gravity Right. So, anyway, the moon, uh, up as a very stark contrast to the Earth, is supposedly, uh, well, the atmosphere close to the moon's surface is essentially a good vacuum, according, according to scientists. That means there would be no 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch of uh, barometric pressure. And in fact, the little liar knots uh, should have weighed, you know, maybe one six hundredth of what they normally would on a scale on Earth. Because again, you're not just dealing with one sixth gravity, you know, quote unquote gravity, but you're also dealing with uh, essentially zero barometric pressure. And so really what should have happened was, is there little uh, 11 layered suits that were uh, 16th inch, I believe, in diameter, if I'm not mistaken, something like that, less than a quarter inch, uh, 3 16th inch in diameter, little rubbery, bubbly suits that uh, should have technically exploded. You know, they were sort of stitched together, rubbly, bubbly suits. Ridiculous that uh, they stepped out into this near perfect vacuum and didn't, uh, their suits didn't, you know, bubble up and explode, and the astronauts' fluids didn't boil away and freeze and then boil on the surface of the moon. I mean, it's just totally ridiculous that they got away with all that. But the, the point that I was trying to make is that NASA uh, t essentially told on themselves, gave themselves away when they confirmed the theory that, uh, uh, you know, say a 200 pound man should weigh one to six of that so that would be what 33.33 .33 pounds that's okay so according to their gravitic theory um, a 200 pound man would weigh one six his weight so that would be about 33.33 .33, 33 and a third uh, pounds okay however uh, this this is what they reported which means everybody that worked for NASA must have missed the day at school where they were taught about barometric pressure. Because again, uh, barometric pressure plays a huge role in our weight on a scale, as well as the boiling point of water. But if you gain an altitude, uh, you will weigh slightly less due to barometric pressure. And in fact, uh, if you travel to the North Pole where the barometric pressure is at its, it is at its, it is at its highest, you will weigh slightly more. Um, however, if you went to the theoretical moon where there's one sixth gravity and no barometric pressure, you'd be as light as a feather. I mean, those guys should have been hopping around looking like they're on pogo sticks. They should have been leaping uh, entire buildings with a single bound. I, I would have really been worried about uh, the very weak gravity of the moon pulling me back down towards it, to be very honest, since there is no uh, barometric pressure to speak of, allegedly, on the surface of the moon. And any scientist worth his salt would agree that the uh, lack of gravity and lack of uh, barometric pressure in this theoretical moon landing scenario would cause a man to weigh much, much less than just one-sixth of his weight, um, which proves yet again that NASA was lying. So a few, you know, I just mentioned a few things that are wrong with NASA, a few admitted problems with the Mercator projection. At the end of the day, Lyons tends to go out of their way to confirm the often bizarre and preposterous theorem of the most esteemed and scientific minds. Um, okay, so that was the Mercator projection. That was some problems with it. 
um, because again, it's not a model, it's a map, it's a projection. Now we'll move on to the azimuthal equidistant projection or the AE, simply AE projection, uh, or you could say maybe the Gleason's map is another example of, uh, of the sort. Now I will first mention that uh, much like the Mercator's projection, the AE projection is not a model of the world. Uh, but is merely a projection of the land masses and oceans arranged upon a matrix based on magnetic north and celestial observations. And those celestial observations, again, are assigned uh, assumed mathematical latitude and longitude lines. Now, the AE projection, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is a lot like the globe, in a sense, uh, from the North Pole to the equator. It's very similar. Uh, the problem with the AE projection is that it is mostly accurate uh, directly center of the map. Uh, and you can actually put that center of the map in the North Pole or the Egypt or anywhere. You can move the center of an AE projection around, but in most cases you see the central uh, point being the North Pole. Now, the further away you get from that center point, wherever it is, and we'll say for this instance it is the North Pole, uh, the more and more skewed the distances between and sizes of uh, large continental land masses become. Now at the equator, things are more or less adequate representations uh, of the continental land masses. However, it is uh, sort of skewed because you've gone uh, really quite far from the uh, Arctic Circle. However, once you get south of the equator on the AE projection, everything begins to spread out uh, sort of exponentially due to the very matrix of the projection. Now, I will quickly mention that not one, one single degree of longitude has ever been measured and confirmed in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, this was all done, you know, hundreds of years ago in the Northern Hemisphere throughout history. Uh, however, when these lines of longitude were calculated in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, at some point the Earth was assumed to be a sphere, so it seemed sufficient as a huge shortcut to rubber stamp the Southern Hemisphere uh, longitudinal degrees as clones of their respective uh, line in the North. So, in other words, if you confirm the distance of a single degree of longitude at the 45 degree north latitude, if you assume that the Earth is a sphere, then you can make a huge shortcut and don't even bother measuring the 45 degree south and merely clone stamp that exact value uh, in terms of a distance of one degree of longitude into the hemisphere. Now, this is problematic, uh, and in fact, practical sailors have indeed documented that the southern latitudes are longer around than the northern latitudes, uh, the northern respective latitudes, meaning a degree of longitude does appear to be greater in the south. When compared to in the north. Now, at the same time, the AE projection inaccurately exacerbates the uh, sort of squishing and spreading of land masses and oceans um, merely based on the matrix of the projection itself. Now, here's some real data that you can find in Zetetic Astronomy, uh, which it really is a must read for anybody that's looking into flat Earth. Now, I don't uh, necessarily agree with Dr. Robotham, who wrote Zetetic Astronomy. Um, I don't agree with him on everything, uh, but he certainly did a great job way back in 1865 um, documenting and sourcing uh, proof that the southern latitude rings are sort of longer or wider round or of a larger radius than uh, the respective latitude rings in the northern area or the central area. So check out this video link, um, but you should definitely read uh, all of Zetetic. And if you don't want to read it, I've actually got it in audiobook format on my channel, read by yours truly. Um, and I did include the pertinent uh, images and diagrams. Uh, so um, it is, I don't know, I, I, I wasn't able to put it down once I started reading it, um, if you're into that sort of thing. But um, it is in 15 minute chunks, so you don't have to do the whole book at once. Although I've got a playlist that uh, you, know, you can watch or listen to uh, Zetetic Astronomy uh, should you choose to do so. But it is uh, 
To me, it's really important because it is, uh, it's from 1865. It shows that uh, the argument, which is uh, echoed in the Globe Earth community, uh, this argument that you know people have known for thousands of years that the Earth was a globe and it was never even debated, uh, when in fact it was debated in the 1800s, it was debated in 300 BC when it was first postulated, and down through the ages it was debated. Um, right up into 1865, right up into the early 1900s, and even up to till today, um, it's debated because, uh, well, there's just way too much evidence uh, proving conclusively that the Earth is not a spinning sphere in a vacuum of space. Admitting, you know, that I do not uh, agree with Robotham on everything, you know, it's a it's a definite must read, and so check that out uh, if, when you've got the time. If you're into uh, sort of scientific proofs, um, it might put you to sleep. So that's another good thing too. If you try, if you can't sleep, just put on Zetetic. No, I'm kidding. It's not that bad, um, but it is in 15 minute bite sized videos. Uh, Anyway, so there are three uh, really far south port cities which lie on the south tip of Africa, the south tip of America, and the southern tip of Australia. Um, they actually name out each of the ports in Zetetic Astronomy, but you sort of get the idea. Now these three uh, areas, these port cities in the far south, uh, lie upon an average of about 45 degrees south, not straying too much from 45 degrees south, but on average 45 degrees south. And so we're talking about halfway uh, from the equator to the pole on average. Now, the distances in nautical miles is documented by practical sailors who were experts in navigation, uh, map making, and uh, of course tracking uh, based on celestial observations and uh, making maps as they went, mapping out coastlines and such, uh, found, you know, that the total distance between these three southern port cities, and it wasn't uh, just one uh, ship or captain, but sort of collectively it was found that the distance between these three southernmost port cities uh, was a total of about 22,000 nautical miles. So when you convert that to statute miles, it equates to 25,317 miles, which is actually wider around than the equator. And again, we're talking about 45 degrees south on average. Now, even, um, you know, if you don't realize this, then any um, latitudinal ring, if you will, or latitudinal line, you know, east to west line, 45 degrees south, so halfway to the pole, uh, should not be anywhere near the uh, radius or anywhere near the circumference of the equator. It should be far, far less than that. And so this documented evidence uh, really needs to be uh, confirmed by modern, you know, geodetic surveyors. Uh, however, you know, unfortunately, we're not able to do that due to the Antarctic Treaty. We can take guided tours from those three southernmost areas directly, you know, straight across to the uh, outskirts of the Antarctic. Uh, however, you can't travel from outpost to outpost and uh, you can't do any geodetic surveying of the entire thing. And so we really are sort of in the dark as to what's out there. But if you look at some of the footage from Antarctica, it just seems uh, completely different than what you find in the north. And people say this is because of global warming, but uh, Antarctica is just this huge, uh, you, you know, hundreds of foot tall, miles of, you know, miles deep, uh, sort of glaciers and then huge mountain ranges and it seems to go on and on and on um, you don't there's no indigenous life except for penguins the water becomes uh, the pH balance of the water changes as you travel south it gets colder on average um, the southern polar region is colder on average and by record than the northern polar region so you know you simply just don't have this bilateral symmetry that you'd expect to see on a sphere um, and, and when, you, when you look at the data of mariners who claim that the total distance around the average 45 degrees south latitude 
uh, is 22,000 nautical miles or over 25,000 miles, then, you know, that really is a big, huge problem for the globe Earth and that needs to be uh, dealt with. And I think that we need to start measuring degrees of longitude in the far south, all over the place, and not just, you know, in Australia, New Zealand, or South America, or South Horn of Africa. Uh, we need to do it from the Antarctic, and people just aren't able to do that for some reason, except for at three chosen locations, which are just not conducive to free scientific study. And um, that's a real shame. Now, not only do you have this uh, practical evidence of the southern rings, if you know we're assuming a flat Earth azimuthal equidistant projection, uh, the southern rings of latitude are indeed appearing to get wider and wider as you travel south. However, not only do you have this actual, you know, widening of latitude rings as you go south, but then you also have an exacerbation of that due to the matrix of the AE map itself. Okay, so with all that being said, the issue with this flight is irrelevant. Uh, the AE projection is presented by antagonists as a model when, again, it is a projection with inherent admitted flaws in it, just like all the other projections, um, just like the major flaws and issues with the Mercator projection that was used for hundreds of years to accurately navigate. Um, none of these maps, the Mercator projection, the Gleason's, the AE, none, none of them, not even the globe, are accurate representations of the face of the Earth. And they couldn't be. And the images we get from NASA couldn't be accurate representations of the land masses because they appear just as the Mercator projection. So, I think I've nailed that point home. Now, getting to the question with all that sort of background information, I know I'm sort of long-winded, but sometimes background information can be helpful. Um, The distance between Santiago, Chile, and uh, between Santiago to Chile is about 8,000 miles. Now, this would be according to following a perfectly east to west trajectory upon a plane. Uh, due east and west are a giant curve around the central north. Okay, and so even though you know this distance being 8,000 miles is a measured distance. Okay, or an, an approximate measured distance, and it is not what it looks like on the AE projection. Okay, and I can kind of play around with the AE projection and show you what I mean. Um, if you put certain points in the center of the AE projection, you can make the United States of America wrap around the entire outside edge. Okay, so there's, uh, there's issues with it, right? Um, so anyway, the distance between Santiago to Chile is about 8,000 miles if you're following uh, what the mariners would have been following, which is magnetic north and the stars. Okay, so we're talking about a, an east to west trajectory upon a plane. Uh, due east and due west would be a giant curve around the central north, and the further south you get, the more the, you know, the longer that, curves become, that curve becomes. And so a more direct route towards two uh, distant areas that are essentially along the same uh, latitude, a shortcut is necessary by flying or traveling a chord of that curve, as opposed to traveling the entire 8,000 mile curve distance. Uh, however, even assuming the 8,000 mile distance, an airliner can cruise at a uh, ground speed of up to 550 miles an hour. Uh, they usually average less than 500, but 550 is doable. So uh, we'll look at this both ways and I'll create a few tables showing some very possible flights with the given distances described by real mariners who actually made these trips on their own volition, on their own accord, by their own reckoning, tracking as they went, masters of this, do, you know, did this their whole lives, you know, they were bred for this, bred for exploration and mapping things fairly accurately uh, using the stars and using magnetic north, okay? 
So we're not talking about estimated distances, uh, we're talking about them traveling east to west between these two general locations about 8,000 miles along that curve because they would have necessarily uh, traveled along that east to west curve um, described by, you know, magnetic north and east and west being a right angle to uh, north, uh, east and west would always be described as a curve. Now, assuming that in our technical age, flights are able to take advantage of this uh, known shortcut uh, by taking the chord between the two points, which would be a straight line as opposed to a curve, which we all know a straight line is always the shortest distance between two points. Um, but we'll take a look at both and um, we'll show how so, you know, some uh, very possible flights even given the distances described by real mariners who actually made these trips on their own back in the day, documented them, and um, I am using Zetetic Astronomy as my source on this. Uh, but yeah, there really is uh, some good old genius to manual navigation and meticulous tracking of one's position at sea, and your life depends on it, so you better be good, even though, you know, Columbus missed India by thousands of miles. We still call Native Americans Indians, but whatever. Anyway, um, there is some genius to manual navigation. Uh, however, it is based on celestial observations and uh, magnetic north and assumed latitude and longitude lines. Um, so there you have that. So first, let's take a look at the full 8,000 mile east to west curve followed by the plane hypothetically. If the plane were to average 475 miles an hour, which is what they usually tend to do for commercial jets, it would be a 16 hour and 50, that's five zero minute flight. So 1650, 16 hour, 50 minute flight, if that's at 475 miles an hour. If they were to do average 500 miles an hour, it would be a 16 hour flight. And at 550, they would average about 14 hours and 30 minutes. Now, on the other hand, and again, that was if they were traveling the full 8,000 8, miles along the east to west curve. I don't think they would do that anymore because they're not relying on compasses. Uh, everything, you know, all of the, the points that they need to go to are mapped out on a flat earth matrix. And so we don't need to follow, you know, the stars or magnetic north when everything's mapped out on a computer and you've got... Uh, geo positioning or ground based positioning systems, which are indeed supported by uh, vast arrays of towers all over the place. That's how you get GPS. It has nothing to do with satellites. And if it does have anything to do with satellites, it would be geostationary weather balloons. They've been using them for decades and decades. So, okay. If you're traveling the chord, however, of this east to west arc, that would reduce the distance uh, significantly, uh, which is, you know, traveling uh, point to point in a straight line rather than following the east to west, which would be a curve on the flat earth or azimuthal equidistant matrix. Now, I'm not going to get into complex mathematics to, deter to determine the exact, you know, amount of the shortcut exactly by, you know, taking this shortcut along the chord of the arc, which the arc being 8,000 miles with a radius of about 8,000 miles, assuming the 45 degrees south uh, is about 25,308 statute miles around, according to the uh, you know, mariners. Um, however, I will conservatively, very conservatively assume that this shortcut would cut off about at least 7.5% of the total arc between Santiago and Sydney. Now, the shortest distance between two points is indeed a straight line. So if due east is a giant curve, then a more direct route would be, assuming you're going east to west, uh, it would be to first travel slightly northeast, and then in the middle of your journey head slightly southeast, and this could sort of, uh, sort of create a straight line between the east-west arc between the two points for sure. The, the math on that is 8,000 times 0 0.075, which equals 600. And uh, 8,000 minus 600 it would equal a 7,400 mile journey if you can take that shortcut. 
So an estimated 7,400 miles east to west chord is followed rather than the east to west arc, then at 475 miles an hour, you're talking about a 15 hour and 35 minute flight. At 500 miles an hour, you're talking about a 14 hour and 50 minute flight. And at 550 miles an hour, you're talking about 13 hour, 45 minute flight. So really in either one of these is totally doable, honestly. Uh, furthermore, since the Earth is not a sphere, uh, the shortest flight between these two points should be crossing over the South Pole, actually, or at least going in that general, you know, sort of South Arctic Circle direction, yet zero, zero commercial flights go anywhere near the South Pole. Uh, they really truly avoid the southern region like the plague. Uh, even though the South Polar Area should be a shortcut to all sorts of places all over the world in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, this is of course in reality because going towards the South Pole is going to take you uh, further away from everything. Uh, the same, however, cannot be said about the North as there are tons of airline flights which traverse you know, near the Arctic Circle and take advantage of that shortcut, uh, which we should see this all the time in the Southern Hemisphere as well. However, flights go way out of their way to avoid the South Polar Area, when it should be a shortcut to tons of places in the south Southern or outer semi-plane. Right, so I hope this helps, and, and uh, I put here in my comment, I hope, I, I think I might do a video on this point, as it is a question that comes up a lot, and uh, I haven't covered it too much in depth, although I have sort of mentioned it a few times on different videos and, and venues, but uh, cheers and thanks for the question. All right, so that ends my answer to that question. However, the there's another one that I want to cover real quick, which is the apparent opposing rotation of the Southern Stars as this is another one that globbers somehow feel proves a spinning spherical Earth conclusively, even when they're presented with physical evidence that the world lacks all curvature and axial rotation and orbital motion, etc. So, <laughs> since we all observe a very small portion of the heavens from the ground, and we all have what is essentially a large convex lens filled with atmosphere which behaves like a liquid on large scales uh, causing the optical illusion interpreted by our eyes which are also convex lenses so that the most distant visible stars you know laterally speaking uh, laterally away from 90 degrees overhead uh, the the most distant stars will appear to drop lower and lower and eventually the most distant stars will appear to nearly merge with the ground. Now, we know that if you're about six feet tall, uh, then your ground horizon is about three and a half miles away. Now, this is true whether the Earth is a sphere or a plane. Uh, it has to do with your uh, angle of attack or line of sight towards the horizon. Now, I will say that uh, in the flat Earth reality, the ground horizon may be three and a half miles away. However, the stars that appear to be near the ground are probably much, much more distant than that. Uh, you got to understand they're probably on a plane that's thousands of miles removed from us, and you've got the laws of perspective causing them to appear to drop, you know, lower and lower in the sky as they uh, get more distant from you. But you also have this convex lens of atmosphere that follows you around everywhere, which is actually the cause of sunrise and sunset, and the cause of, uh, that sort of exacerbates perspective at the macro levels uh, for distant, distant objects like stars and suns and moons. Um, this sort of subjective bubble all around you causes uh, the stars near the ground, or the distant lateral stars to appear near the ground. Right, so, um, anyway, in terms of your angle of attack or line of sight uh, towards the horizon from six feet, you know, that's three and a half miles away. Now, if you were to climb up, say, to 14 feet and then stand up on top of that, so, you know, you're 20 feet tall, then your apparent uh, horizon will increase in distance. So there's definitely a direct correlation with horizon and altitude. Now, there is a cap to this as at a certain point, uh, well over a hundred thousand feet in altitude but uh, once you start viewing uh, really super high altitude weather balloon footage um, even though your altitude should give you an extremely large field of view which it does 
Um, the atmosphere itself uh, eventually becomes just totally an opaque barrier and it merely reflects all the light back at you so you can't see anything beyond a certain point due to the atmosphere um, which is why you have a blue sky during the day and a black sky filled with stars during the night at least on the ground now you'll notice that in high altitude balloon shots uh, although you are indeed above the, above the blue sort of troposphere the atmosphere consisting of lower density gases perhaps helium and others um, those gases are still reflecting and reflect, uh, refracting light back towards you and they appear as opaque just as the blue sky does although these gases uh, for some reason for whatever reason appear to be black as opposed to blue and this is evidenced because you cannot see any stars in such high altitude weather balloon footage even when you know people argue that it's due to exposure it's due to you know the sun's too bright and the earth's too bright uh however even when the camera sort of bounces away and there's no super bright object to expose um you don't ever catch even small glimpses of stars from high altitude balloon footage during the day so this leads me to believe that we're still getting a great deal of uh sort of an opaque atmosphere uh, reflecting light back at us, but it is a black, uh, it is a blackness instead of a blueness to it for whatever reason. You'll actually very rarely find high altitude weather balloon footage with any stars in it at all. Um, you can, I guess if you use a uh, diffraction lens and launch at night, However, you really can't find uh, very many uh, nighttime weather balloon launches on the record. Now, I did stumble into one, which I made a couple of videos on. I'll try to uh, find a link and put it in the description because this one's still sort of a mystery to me. I'd like to know what you guys think about it. I'm not sure if I had it on my secondary channel or not. But anyway, I'll, I'll put a link for that one in here uh, because I did uh, get a clip sent to me of a weather balloon that was uh, launched it looked like it was launched right at sunset and uh, the sun was set, appeared to be setting when it was launched and then when the weather balloon got up uh, high enough the sun re-emerged and you had you know the sun was right there but you also had stars in the picture which was really sort of perplexing to me and it led me to believe they were using some sort of a filter or a diffraction lens in order to get those stars uh, with the sun in the same shot. Now, there are others who told me that that wasn't the sun, but it was the moon, although that's a whole other thing. You'll have to watch the video. I will, I will find it and I'll link it up. Now, in any case, the way in which we observe the night sky is complete, and the day sky is completely subjective, and we really do not fully understand to what extent starlight is being perturbed as the source light, which is not in the visible spectrum, uh, nor do we know how distant it is in terms of the source of the starlight. But whatever the source light is, it's passing through a variety of varying media, such as ionized plasma tubes, which run meridionally or north to south in the lower magnetosphere. Uh, then you've got electromagnetic fields or vor an electromagnetic vortex generated by the Earth itself. Uh, then you've got varying layers of atmosphere in terms of uh, varying temperature, varying density, varying gas types, etc., etc., etc. So we really cannot ascribe the behavior of the apparent celestial lights to exactly correlate uh, to the behavior of the Earth. So as so many unknown variables are indeed affecting light waves before they finally meet our eye in the visible spectrum, right? So if you could imagine a flat surface, say a basketball court, with uh, upturned glasses of drinking water uh, filled with water every square foot, say you can observe or someone can observe uh, from within each and every one of these glasses of water at will. Now imagine taking a large flood lamp or a stadium light, or really an omnidirectional light, and running it across the half line of the basketball, basketball court. 
uh, each observer within the glasses spread out from you know net to net would experience a totally different subjective instance of this what would appear to be a rising and setting of this floodlight that merely went in a plane overhead this would be due to the laws of perspective and how light waves behave when passed through a liquid medium and again we're all walking around with the giant liquid medium surrounding us uh, which is more on the macroscopic level because it's a gas, but it still is there and light is certainly passing through it before it reaches our eye. So for such observers in this experiment inside the little glasses on the basketball court, for them to try and uh, triangulate on the sun to gauge its uh, size or distance using observations from within these little glass cups filled with water, uh, it would be ridiculous and folly to try and triangulate on any, you know, source light object from such a subjective little situation. Even if they had instant communication between all of these places, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to figure out because, um, especially if the little observers in those cups didn't know uh that they were in little cups right i mean does that am i making sense here i really hope that i'm getting this point across and not sounding too silly um now i i don't believe that we have the capability to accurately estimate the distance to the actual sun um, at least not from the ground level as there are just too many variables uh, where light can be perturbed and uh, inverted and bent and just rendered into the visible spectrum. I mean, there's so many unknowns that are going on, whether it's a sphere or flat, um, to that light before it reaches your eye, uh, it's really quite uh, naive to think that we can somehow interpolate the light that we see in the sky to, you know, prove anything here on the ground. There are just lights in the sky. Um, there has been a very heavy indoctrination campaign throughout our lives to make us think that those lights in the sky are filled with, you know, aliens and Luke Skywalker and Jabba the Hutt, but in fact, they're merely lights in the sky. Another thing, uh, if you've ever played with a magnifying glass, you'll know that as you change relative distances between your eye and the glass or whatever you're observing, you'll find situations where the object uh, that you're observing will invert or turn upside down. Now, this same sort of phenomenon could cause the apparent counter-rotation of the stars in the southern hemisphere plane, although there are other possible explanations that could go along with this as well. Now, since we know the Earth generates an electro uh, electromagnetic field, which appears to be uh, exactly like an, a magnetic vortex emanating from the central north uh, in all directions, uh, out and south, then the direction of the center, uh, the center of that vortex, is always going to be the opposite of the direction of the uh, outside edge of the vortex. So in other words, if the, cent if the center is spinning clockwise, then the exterior rotation would be counterclockwise, and that's just how uh, electromagnetic vortices work. Now, since light waves are merely the visible spectrum of electromagnetic waves, then they can absolutely be affected and perturbed by large, powerful magnetic flux lines, which certainly exist above and around the Earth, flat or globe. Now, when you connect the dots regarding all of these facts, being the subjective bubble of Atmos plane around each observer, and the vastness of space compared to our 3.5 mile distant observable hori uh, horizon reality, uh, along with the electromagnetic nature of the Earth itself, it becomes obvious to this speaker that the supposed counter-rotation of the stars in the south uh, proves nothing but our inability to adequately observe all of the Earth at once. Now, for starters, the South Polar stars simply do not behave in such a way as those in the North do. You can focus your telescope towards Polaris, and the North Pole star will remain fixed in uh, essentially the same location forever uh, throughout history. Now, the same cannot be said for any star, or even a point in space for the South. 
Now, since we can observe the North Pole Star in the north from anywhere uh, on the equator or north, uh, starting as far south as the equator or even documented as far south as the southern tropic of Capricorn, uh, that was documented in Zetetic as well. So again, the North Pole Star can be seen from any point along the equator, you know, in the sky, in the north, always, right? However, the same thing cannot be said about uh, a single star or any point in the southern uh, hemisphere. So, again, the, the necessary bilateral symmetry in terms of a south polar point of axis of rotation, um, it simply doesn't exist. Okay, the necessary bilateral symmetry to result in an overall sphere does not exist. Now, besides all that, the long-term existence of the North Pole star uh, being fixed above the North Pole for all of recorded history totally debunks the heliocentric model by itself alone, as the alleged 26,000-year cycle of the precession of the equinoxes should cause the northern axis to precess uh, through its alleged wobble at a rate of 1 degree every 72 years. This means we should have seen a series of North Stars throughout history, and the fact that we do not see a series of North Stars throughout history conclusively disproves the heliocentric model as we enter into the age of Aquarius according to the precession of the equinoxes. Um, I'll invite you all to watch a video I released recently covering the topic of precession in a bit more detail, so I will link that up and put a card up there. Um, other than that, uh, I appreciate everyone joining me. Now, if you would like to support this channel, it is needed. Uh, this is a viewer-supported channel. Um, you can do so more easily via PayPal to um, the direct link, paypal.me slash themorgyle1. Uh, or if you're used to using PayPal, you can uh, support this channel through PayPal to j-o-n-e-lance at gmail.com or directly through fan funding on YouTube, although I think that's for a limited time only. I've heard rumors that YouTube may be uh, doing away with uh, fan funding. So PayPal is actually preferred anyway, and you can do it super easy through the direct link. Again, it's uh, PayPal me, paypal.me slash themorgyle1. So with that, God bless you all. Thanks so much for watching. Spread the word, spread the world, and peace. used by modern science, the Mercator projection or the updated Peters projection, which is essentially the same deal as the Mercator projection. Uh, but this other big problem is the fact that one can only circumnavigate uh, from east to west, uh, but certainly not from north to south on the Mercator projection or Peters projection. So if you head uh, west from the left of the Mercator projection, you will instantly pop out at the right side of the map. <laughs> According to Globers, this is because it's a globe, but according to reality, you're merely describing a circle upon a plane around the magnetic central pole. Now, if you do head south from the bottom of the Mercator projection, uh, for example, you will not pop out at the top, um, which is, you know, a major problem. However, that's where they get the cylindrical part of the uh, type of projection, the cylindrical conformal map. Now, if you do head, let's just say due north from the top, um, what, according to the heliocentric model and the Mercator projection, what will happen is, is you'll essentially make a bell curve on that map. Let's see, I'm trying to do this backwards. You'll essentially make a bell curve on that map where if you head due north, uh, you'll sort of 
as uh, he or she did post this question uh, to me as a private message on YouTube. So the question or comment was, I was wondering, uh, quote, I was wondering if you have anything to explain the trips from Santiago to Sydney, as this seems to be the last piece of the puzzle to me. Okay, so uh, my answer to that, and this is something that does come up a lot, is uh, hello, Claude. We'll keep it at a first name basis. There's millions of Claudes out there. Um, you know, that's a question that gets asked a lot. And I feel like the problem, you know, that people have with these flights are more perceived problems or really misunderstandings as opposed to real actual physical problems with the flat earth reality. So here's the deal. Uh, the AE, or azimuthal equidistant projection map, has some major flaws in the matrix of the map that are eh, fairly similar to the flaws in the scientifically accepted Mercator projection and the like. So here's the difference between the two. Uh, we'll start with the Mercator projection, and this applies to others like the Peters projection. Um, I would first mention that the Mercator projection nor the Peters projection are models of the Earth, uh, nor are they an adequate representation of the actual face of the Earth. Um, these are merely projections based on estimations derived from latitude and longitude lines, uh, which are based on heavenly lights and magnetic north, which always involved magnetic north, as well as celestial observations, which are ascribed to mathematically defined lines of latitude and longitude. Now, this map, the Mercator projection, allows for long distance travel across great oceans. However, it is not an accurate depiction of the overall face of the Earth. Uh, the reason the Mercator projection is sufficient for navigation, while being so inaccurate in terms of an actual representation of the face of the Earth, is because it includes what are called lines of constant course, or it was designed uh, with this uh, concept of lines of constant course, uh, which are derived, again, from magnetic north and astronomical observations, which are ascribed to the lines of latitude and longitude. So, uh, in other words, on the Mercator projection, you can draw a uh, straight line, a horizontal line from right to left, and that would be due west from, say, Europe to America. However, the relative sizes of and the distances betwixt the two continents is inherently going to be skewed in the Mercator projection, becoming more and more exacerbated as you gain a distance north of the equator in the case of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in the case of the Southern Hemisphere, it's a little bit different, especially considering the Flat Earth model. Now, the other big problem with the Mercator projection is um, what essentially and time. So, the Mercator projection is, by definition, a cylindrical conformal map. Now, what this means, the long and short of it is that the equator of the map, you know, the straight line directly across the center, is most correct or most accurate. Uh, that is the most accurate portion of the map in terms of relative sizes of and distances between the large continental land masses as well as the seas that separate them. Now, as you stray either north or south of the equator, uh, the less and less accurate the Mercator projection becomes uh, to the point to where the 90 degree latitudes of north and south, so the poles, uh, these single points on the sphere are stretched to infinity across the entire length of the top and bottom of the map. So in other words, the top and bottom of the Mercator projection and the Peters uh, depiction uh, are so far removed from what the actual sizes and distances between the areas, any significant distance from the equator as uh, extremely skewed and inaccurate. So pretty much everywhere south of the Tropic of Capricorn or north of the Tropic of Cancer, uh, the relative sizes and distances of continents cannot possibly be correct on the Mercator projection by definition. Yet it allows for adequate navigation as it relied throughout history on manual navigation, which Uh, 
so what's up everybody john the morgyle back with a video response to a question slash comment that i got from a subscriber uh i recently realized and i actually posted evidence in a recent video uh, and i'll actually roll that here as well that my comments on youtube when i'm logged in as the morgyle appear to go up to me on visible public threads but when i log out of the morgyle account uh, and view the same video as anonymous or view the same video uh, thread from a different account altogether, comments that, you know, that I've posted as the Morgyle simply don't exist. And um, this is occurring not only on my own videos, but also on others' videos. Now, uh, I'm starting to do some video responses to comments that I get because it seems that like I can't even reply to comments uh, in many cases uh, on video threads, whether it's my threads or others threads. So uh, the question comes from a subscriber who will remain anonymous.